Cool. Can you hear me? Is it working? Yes. yes. Great. So I'm Alicia. I um, have a master's in quantitative economics, but for the past few years I've been doing web development. And I just moved here, so I decided to um, find a group of people to do fun things with and decided Kaggle sounds interesting. I've never done any Kaggle competitions, so I decided to talk about one to learn more. And I am currently not working, so I'm also interested in those jobs that were mentioned over there. Um, okay, so I picked a um, Mercari Price Suggestion Challenge because I have a bit of a background in economics, so I figured I kind of know what it is about, but then it turned out I don't really know what it is about, uh, which I'm going to get to later. And um, to get you started on that, Mercari is a, a marketplace, and users can sell pretty much anything. When I say anything, is they can say, sell anything that's between three and two thousand dollars because that's the price range. And it's a pretty interesting experience if you look at the website because when you get started on it, you see only a picture and a price and a number of likes. So it's a bit different from buying on eBay or buying, you know, on Amazon because you don't have any text here. And this competition was about NLP. Um, so the purpose of this competition is um, for Mercari to help the sellers price their products. And the challenge was about creating a model that's going to help them with that based on the inputs that the sellers are giving Mercari. Uh, so why is pricing tricky in the first place? Um, so, you know, this is a bit of an equilibrium challenge where the seller wants to get the best price and the buyer wants to get the best price. And those prices are very different because the seller wants to get the most money and the buyer wants to give the, le the less money they can, right? Um, so in economic theory, there's a lot of background here, like how can you know what something is worth? And for that, you need to do market research. And for that, you need to understand what you're actually selling and who's going to be interested in that. And you need to find a market and an audience. And if you're a buyer, you also have this cost of figuring out what you really want, uh, why do you want it, and where to buy it. Um, so both sides pretty much want to get a good deal out of it and find an equilibrium. So you want to price your products at, at a price that's going to sell, but also you want to make some profit, right? Um, so the tricky part here is to understand um, both sides, like what's the seller willing to sell the item for and what's the buyer willing to pay. And Mercari gives some guide guidelines for the sellers. Um, one is do market research, which is, which is basically just look through our website and see how items that are similar to your item have been priced before. Uh, another thing is you need to keep in mind the seasonality of items. So if you're say, selling a winter coat, you should probably sell it for less in the summer and reverse is probably also true. And you can also adjust the price. So it does, until you sell it, an item and you see it doesn't really sell, you can adjust the price. Um, probably most of the people would lower it over time. And there is a flat 10% fee on anything you sell. Um, so if you go to view a product, um, the most prominent part of it is the photo. And that's what the users see when they buy, want to buy something. Then it's the title the price, uh, the number of likes. This item hasn't been liked, but many of them have likes. Uh, there is the condition, and condition is like from new to very used. Um, there is the shipping information, which is, are you going to pay for the shipping, or is the seller going to pay for the shipping? There is a short description, and it's really, really tiny. Like under the username and everything, you can see there is a description somewhere. Um, it's not very prominent. Uh, there is a category, and you can only choose one category for your product. So choosing a category somehow tells you something about the seller's expectations about this product. And there is a brand name, and you know that can potentially be useful, but also kind of tricky, because if it's a brand nobody knows, that doesn't really matter much. But maybe since this is a beauty blender and that's a brand, uh, maybe that's going to matter here. Uh, so the data... Um, for this competition doesn't include photos. Question. Yes, sorry. Do you know if they have information on when the product was first put up on the website? So if Mercari has it or is it? Or if not, not Mercari, just the, as a buyer, can I see when the item was put up? Uh, it's not on there. I, yeah, it's, there is a time. 
timestamp up there, but I'm not sure what timestamp. We can check, probably. Like, there are some. I wonder if, as a buyer, I could use that to be like, wow, this item is. Um, let's see. Let's click an item and let's see. I don't know. That's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, so let's make it a bit bigger. Um, and it says where it's been put for sale, too. So you can see connect to cut. It's not very prominent, but it's interesting. But I don't know if that's. You know, if that's the first price, or is that the, la the last price that has been updated? I right. would probably assume this is the... Um, I don't really know which one makes most sense, to be honest. But Mercari doesn't really say that anywhere. Um, cool. That's a good thing to check. But I, I don't know which date is that. So about the category, you mentioned that there's just one category, but... Yeah, so this is like a nested category. So the first, the oh, highest okay. is elect electronics, then it's cell phones, and then it's cases. So you pick one category, and it's like nested in a tree of categories. And there are, most of the time, there are three levels. Sometimes there are two levels in this tree. So um, you can't put it in like a different category that's not... Yeah, you can only pick one. Yep. Anything else is yet? Yeah, there is a question. Uh, just to make sure I understand the problem. I think we can <laughs> Just press it once till the light goes green. Or shout. Okay, I uh, just want to make sure that I understand the problem. Um, so, the suggested price, is it uh, like a single number or a range? Um, um, so, that's a single number you're supposed to provide. So, if you look at the data, the submissions are just ID and price pairs. So, for every item, when you submit uh, your answers, you only get ID and price. So, it's not a range, yeah. That's a good question. Um, sure. I have a lot of hair. Maybe if I just put my hair here, that works better? Cool. Great. Thank you. Cool. Um, so yeah, to the data that the competition participants actually had, there are no photos, um, which is kind of interesting given that it's the most prominent thing about an item. Um, so you get IDs, and those IDs are just integers and it's just enumerated, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, the ID is not a leak in any way. Uh, there is a name of the item, so if you look at um, the item side, there's this part, that's name. Uh, there is item condition and it's uh, integer levels of like one, two, three, four, five from um, the new to the very used one. Uh, there is a category name, uh, which is this tree, so you would get electronics slash cell phone slash um, cases. Uh, there is a brand name, which is a string. There is a price. Uh, so this, that's in the training data. You have a price. Um, there is a shipping. So it's a binary. If you pay for the shipping, <coughs> it's zero. And if, you, if it's free shipping, then it's one. And there is item description, which is this part over here. Um, and name and item description also have some removed data because a lot of sellers put the price in the name, uh, but it's tagged with RM, so it, it's not in the data. Yeah. So you said the, the shipping was a binary flag, right? Zero mm -hmm. if you pay for it and one if you, or sorry, zero if you don't pay for it, one if you don't. Do one it. if it's free shipping, so you don't pay for it, and zero if you do pay for it. As with, a, with the zero, is there another variable for how much that shipping is? No, it's only zero one. And um, the data, you get data in stages. So the first stage of the competition, the test data is about 700,000 rows, and the final test data is 3.5 million. And the data for the public leaderboard stays the same. Uh, so it's the final test data. So this competition had two stages. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Are there any other questions about data? Yeah. Uh, so there's the test data up there, but how much do you have to train on? How much data for training? 
if you remember. Um, yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head. It's about, I think it's about 70,000 I had in the train data. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is all English? Uh, is it all English? As far as I've seen in the data, it seems like it's all English and everyone also only analyzed the language as English. Yeah, so nobody said anything about it not being English anywhere because this is a Japanese website, but they sell in the US. So um, <coughs> that's a bit confusing that it's a Japanese company, but they, everything's in English, yeah. So did uh, Makari say any, uh, the motivation behind this competition? Because it seemed like removing the image data, there must be so much information in there about whether, what the price of a product would be. And it seems like you're sort of tying people's hands behind their back by removing this data by not having it in the training set. They didn't really talk about that much, but there were a lot of questions on the forums. For example, people ask, okay, if you talk about seasonality and you say this is important, you're not giving us the data for that. You're not giving us the sell date, right? And that would be kind of important if we are supposed to take seasonality <coughs> into account. Um, so they, there were discussions, but nobody really addressed those in terms of like, uh, you know, because there is a lot of data that could be useful, like, um, the location, right? You would think the location makes sense, especially since it isn't, they have it as data, and like what state is it going to be sold in? So people asked about it, but nobody really responded. <laughs> also, another thing is in this competition, you could only use the data that was provided. You couldn't scrap the website and get the data on your own, because if you did that, you would just be disqualified. I'd have thought even like metadata um, on the images would be useful to at least, you know, like yeah, what type, but of, what type they, of resolution and things like that would be so useful. But, yeah. but I, I have one comment about the uh, using images. I feel like that would be too difficult to really take advantage of because like how many different images do you have? Like how are you going to train a model to recognize if something is expensive on, on an image? Yeah, that, uh, okay, that would be very interesting. We can talk about that more later. Here you go. I just had one quick question about the seasonality. Did any of the solutions or any uh, people try to infer the seasonality based on how many products sold or the price? Um, so since there were no dates, really, they didn't really have a frame of reference. I haven't seen anyone trying to figure that out, not having any frame of reference for seasonality. Um, but there, you know, there were people were trying to figure out maybe the additional features in the names like winter or summer, but it didn't really go anywhere. Like nobody actually used that in any solution. Was there any missing data if any of the data points in the training set? Um, so there was uh, no missing data as such. Like the brand names were not always there. Um, so that was like one of the fields that was not always um, used by the sellers. But there were some items that were priced at zero. And that was kind of interesting given that you can't really sell at zero on this platform because the lowest price is three. So people just discarded those. Uh, apart from that, the data was pretty good. Like there were, the descriptions were sometimes missing too and they just put no description available. But I haven't seen anyone remove data because of that. They didn't um, take that into account for removing data. Yeah. Um, was there a reason why you would see zero as a price? Is it just just like a missing information, or was it actually like set at zero somehow? So people asked on the discussion forums, but nobody responded to that. So most of people just decided to to remove it. Uh, they assumed this is probably some error in the data itself. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about the price. Uh, so the price, uh, did it include the, the shipping as well? It's like uh, same product, uh, one without shipping, one with shipping, would the, would the price change? And are there cases in the trading data where s equal products or same products have different prices? Uh, I am not aware of any cases of that and nothing on the discussion forum suggested that. You have to remember that this is like a social selling platform. So the way this app works, somebody takes a phone and they take a photo of an item and they sell it. So there are 
rarely there are sellers that sell a lot of items. And as far as I can tell, there are no like repeated items in terms of like this is the same item, but it has, you know, this has shipping and doesn't has to have shipping. It's this is real data from the platform. So they didn't create a training set in a way that would allow you to compare it, uh, you know, keeping some of the um, variables stable, right? It's, this is just raw data from the platform. Uh, were there <laughs> misclass items or like descriptions or category name that had a lot of spelling errors? Like, did that make a difference at all? So the category, category name is something you pick from the tree. So this one didn't really have any errors. As far as description and names go, yes. Uh, but um, the, the people who were trying to like do spell checking on that and figure out how to work with that data, they said it didn't really um, help them with the models. So there was, there was a lot of errors um, in the free text, which is uh, the name and the description. But it didn't really matter, at least from all the submissions I've seen, it didn't really matter to try to spell check it or correct it in any way. Yeah. So there were zeros in the, in the data. Are you aware of any the other extremes, like 999 or thousands for, for a bubble gum or something? So nobody really did an analysis like that, and I didn't go as far as to explore it on my own this way. Uh, there is some odd, so the upper limit is supposed to be 2,000, but there are some items priced at 2,005 or something around that. So people assumed that it might be the shipping price somehow included there, but um, it didn't really come up much, and nobody really talked about it. So. That might have also been an error, but nobody removed those. They only removed the zeros. What, what slide are we on? Um, six. Okay. Yeah. Not too bad. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Yeah, I'm going to talk about data, about data a bit more. So um, this is how it looks. So you can see the, um, the item condition is, uh, it's one to five, here is one to three, but it's only the first 10 rows. The category name is just the tree with slashes. The brand name is often not there. Uh, the price is an integer. That was also interesting to me because it seemed like somebody should price things like, like, at like 9.99, right? But it didn't really happen in this data set. And there is shipping and there's description. And if, if there's no description, it says no description yet. Um, so that's an interesting way to go about that. So that's the train data. Um, OK, so let's look a bit at exploration of this data. Um, I did a little bit on my own, but then I decided people did a better job at it. So uh, I just looked at the zero price items, and I was trying to understand, like, is, it, is there any rule behind it having zero as a price? But it seems like there is none. This is probably just errors in the data. Um, and if you look at price to item condition and you try to figure out like, the, the, if there is any correlation, it seems like this is price versus item condition. This is log price, actually, because this is not very clear. So, it seems like there is no clear color correlation between the item condition and price and also the shipping and the price. Um, and that's like many people said that, um, that, you know, probably the decision tree makes sense here economically, but in terms of data, it doesn't really say anything much about it. Um, so <laughs> people did a lot of data exploration um, on their own. And one interesting I wanted to show you is... Um, so they did like, you know, what were the most common things that people used in, in the descriptions? And they also did analysis of the categories um, and the category levels. Uh, so they're trying to figure out, you know, what's the most popular category? And then on the first, the top level was women. So that kind of makes sense. Um, yeah, so I linked the exploratory data analysis a bit. Um, I would say it didn't really reflect any of the winnings in any of the winning solutions. Um, exploring the data is a fun way of understanding what's happening and economically it makes a lot of sense, but this competition was purely NLP. 
I wasn't really about understanding what the data is about that much, uh, which was pretty surprising because this is real pricing data. Cool. Any? Uh, so the evaluation was uh, root mean squared logarithmic error, but I wanted to like explain a bit what it is. Uh, so root, root mean squared error is just uh, when you have the you know you have the data and you have the prediction and you have the residuals between um, the actual data and the prediction, um, and you square that and you take a root of it. That's root mean squared error, and this is for small data like you know. One to three, this is for bigger data. Um, and root mean squared logarithmic error, the main difference between those two is that this takes a logarithm and um, it's very different for like small, small numbers, for small prices, it doesn't really matter that much which one you use. But for bigger differences and bigger prices, it makes more sense to use the logarithm because it penalizes less. Um, and it reflects the data better because this data is very left skewed. So you have a lot of small prices, but you also have a lot of like, you know, 1500 and that, that would skew the results a lot. So that's why they use the logarithmic uh, error. And a big thing about this competition was the Kaggle kernels. Sorry, one, yeah. one quick question. Can you go sure. back, uh, say, two sides? This one? One side. Okay. Cool. Sorry, I just wanted to know what P and A were. I got it. Oh, yeah, so P is the um, prediction and A is the actual. It's the same as here. This is the prediction, this is the actual. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, it was confusing. Um, so this is a kernels-only competition. Uh, what it means is that Kaggle provided kernels, um, which is both a way of submitting your code and like sharing it with others, but also it then runs on a virtual machine, and they had a very specific setup for all those machines, and every, each and every person had the same kernel. Um, to me, like in theory, it sounds great, because everyone has the same setup. So it's about working on your analysis and not having an ensemble of you know, however many you can have. But for many people, that was a big, big, big problem. And the problems were twofold. So one thing was that the kernels weren't really that reliable. And Kaggle said it themselves. We had kernels that failed, even though they shouldn't really fail. It was pretty inconsistent in terms of like, sometimes you run your kernel and it took 20 minutes, but then you run it again and it took five hours. And you, could, you had no way of saying what's wrong. Was it your code or was it the kernel? Um, so Kaggle was adjusting the kernel during the competition, and that also caused a lot of um, conversations about it and very unhappy um, competition participants. Um, some of them said that kernel competitions are so terrible they should never do any more um, because, you know, that's painful. But um, I would say that it has a lot of potential, right? Because you have to, like, optimize for real-world conditions, not just, like, throw in samples at things, uh, which some people do. Um, and also it's it allows you to maybe better compare the results of different people, right? Because if you work on the same environment, it's more about what you are able to do with that environment. Um, but some people said, oh, you know, the people who know how to tweak the kernels are going to win. And there were a lot of arguments, too, in the discussion forums. That wasn't a very pleasant conversation for anyone involved. Um, so, um, Kaggle, yeah? Um, what would the arguments have been about? Sorry, I'm, I'm so uh, the users were used to like doing a lot of Kaggle competitions before kernels because that's the second kernel competition. So most people are used to ensembles and having a lot of setups. Um, they would say it's unfair, or you know, this is a noob competition, or you know, things like that. Um, are really not very pleasant things about other competition participants. And and people people who just were just starting said this is great because I don't have to worry about like figuring out where I should run my code. I can just run my code and work on my models. Um, I think for Kaggle, it makes sense to have co kernel competitions. That's like, because the company that, that sponsors the competition, they have you know, the same environment. And it seems like they're going to do more of those. Um, and we'll just have to get used to that if we don't like it or be very happy about it if we do like it. I don't think there is one good answer here. But I just wanted to mention that because it was a very big problem 
and um, a lot of conversations were allowed around kernels failing. Another thing was that um, the rules of the competition said that your first stage kernel should run in 60 minutes, and if it doesn't, you're not going to be allowed to compete in the second stage of the competition, and some people were you know, hurt by that because they were unable to continue. Um, so that was another problem, and I'm not sure if Kaggle can say with 100% certainty that it, this was because of the person's code, not kernels. So that's a bit tricky, yeah. Um, you said there's, it, there was inconsistency in the kernels. Do you know who are we blaming for this? Uh, is it Amazon, Microsoft, Google? <laughs> I didn't ask, think to ask this question, but um, you would probably have to know what Kaggle, who Kaggle is working with. Uh, Google. Google. <laughs> Yeah. I th yeah, I, I think that's a very, you know, investor question that I'm not going to go further. No, it's um yeah, that I think it's in general it's a good idea, though a lot of people agree that this also um forces you to pick methods that are going to run quick and those are not necessarily the best methods. Right. Um everyone has an opinion. Um, you can read a lot about other people's opinions in the discussion forums. Um, it was pretty intense. Okay, um, so going into like the solutions and the things I had to refresh or learn in, a, in order to be able to understand what they are talking about. Uh, hopefully this would be useful for more than just me. And some of this stuff is pretty basic, but I figured it's better to explicitly say it, um, because I might be wrong, and if I'm wrong on basic stuff, I'm just wrong everywhere. Um, so a lot of things were discussed you know, around overfitting. A lot, of the, a lot of the discussions were about overfitting the data, and there were many ways people wanted to address that. Uh, so for the, for the most part, they were using uh, rich regression models, uh, which is a regularization method. Um, so you uh, to your loss function, you add a factor of sum of squares of coefficients. It's at the end, the, like the lambda beta at the end. And this increases the penalty for two big parameters. Um, and people are using it mostly because it can reduce the variance. Uh, so the mean squared error, which was the loss function for this competition, is better. But it doesn't necessarily go down to zero. Um, so, it was a useful thing people usually used in the beginning to figure out like which way they should go, but for the most part, it wasn't part of the final ensemble of models. Um, another thing they use is last regression. Um, I actually seen it only uh, in the context of getting all the models in the ensemble and deciding like how to connect them uh, for the first. Um, price uh, competitors, but other people also mentioned that using that during the model. So it's very similar to the ridge regression. Uh, you just use a factor of absolute values instead of a square, uh, which means it can go down to zero, uh, which can reduce the number of features in the model. So the first place competitors said, it was pretty funny, we had 12 models, but at some point our last regression said, okay, we don't want, you don't want any of those, you're just picking some of those for the uh, final solution. So uh, that was pretty interesting. Cool. Um, another thing people used a lot was boosting. So boosting uh, means using a lot of weak learners. So you start with one weak learner and then you add another weak learner that addresses the issues that the initial weak learner didn't really go into. And then you add them until you're happy with your result. Um, so this is a sequential uh, weak learner, learner sorry, uh, ensemble that allows you to address all the data points that you need to take into account. And for the most part, I didn't see XGBoost in this competition at all. And I think part of it is because XGBoost um, takes a lot of memory, and this was a kernel competition, so everyone just was just using a light grade, gradient boosting machine. Um, and as far as I've read in the docs for L, for LGBoost, L, light GBM, sorry, um, XGBoost is just way uh, more intense on your CPU. Also, the machines were CPUs, so that was 
one other thing about the kernels everyone is talking about. Uh, so light GBMs, instead of, instead of growing level-wise, um, it grows leaf-wise, so it reduces the training time. Uh, it takes less memory thanks to that, but it's very sensitive to overfitting. So since everyone, most of the people were using that, they were doing a lot of ways to, to balance the overfitting of light GBM. That makes sense, yeah. Just a small note as well that on the Iceberg Classifier Challenge as well, uh, lots of people use light GBM over XGBoost. XGBoost seems to be being used less now that light GBM is becoming more prominent. Yeah, yeah. It's newer, right? It's like the new fancy model. Yeah. Well, XGBoost was fast. That was the thing about it. Yeah. Well, light well this is also faster. faster. It looks like light GBM. Can anyone comment? Are they on a theory level doing the exact same thing, just a different implementation? On uh, theory level, like look up front, it's the way that they parse the trees is different. Right. Like in terms of memory usage? So in, in terms of memory usage, I don't really know um, on the theory level, but I know on experiment level that um, light GBM is two to five times faster on the and some like you know the models that were testing on that and it's both in Microsoft documentation and also other um, <laughs> sources. So it's not only Microsoft saying this is fast, but this is actually much faster. But I don't I tend to have a theoretical intuition why it should be faster because they, this is like like you're doing leaf wise. So it's like you're getting wider. But um, you, you have more Cost if you are getting taller actually in a boost. So it's like the cost of traversing a tall tree versus a white tree. So something of that sort. Can you, can you try to describe Yeah, if if you if you're traversing a wide tree, like the the height of the tree is smaller. So usually such costs are smaller when you have a like um a tree that's not so tall. Like you have a like um, a tree that's like have more but leaves. You have wise, you have to traverse too when you're taking like decisions yeah. across different. Well, so well, but I mean, still, like, it's the training part that is problematic in terms of the time. But yeah, it's the training time that yeah, we're talking that's about. Habit, yeah, building it, you know, when it's taller, so it's about the height and the width. Be that's where. Well, it's, So it, it? it's so similar to depth for search and breadth for search too. Because of when you go deeper, it, it's sometimes those kind of issues you have. It, so similar like stuff. You need to know a lot about how they implement that in order to... Yeah. So um, I forgot my question, but I have another comment. Because I did take a look at these slides beforehand, and you had a really good resource for understanding yeah. light GBM. Okay, so if anybody's interested in light GBM, which I hope everybody is. Uh, there is a link on the slides. Yes, any... there is. There is a link in the IPython and in the slides. Yeah, uh, that explains it much better than I um, briefly summarized it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Quick, quick note on Kenneth's point. So he was saying that it takes longer to traverse um, light GBM when it's leafwise. Is that right? No, the no. other way around. Oh, it's it. okay. Um, but I think I think the other thing with with light GBM, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the the actual splitting of the tree is that faster? The way that they split the trees this way. No, uh, this is everyone's the guessing. Yeah, I think we should just go each, each individual split should be the same time because it's the same formula. But I don't want to go on and on about this because I can't. Like yeah, I don't but think anyone is comfortable with that yet. Cool. Let's move on then. Um, okay, so I know this sounds pretty basic, but I was um, I realized I don't know how to explain multi multi layer perceptions, so I went back to basics and. A perception, 
um, as a part of a neural network, it receives many inputs, applied a weight, applies a weight on the initial input, then it returns a weighted sum of those inputs, and then the output is evaluated by an activation function, which is basically um, zero if it's below zero and one if it's above zero, and then it goes to the next neuron. Um, so that's the basic way how it works. And why I needed to explain that a bit is because MLPs are made of perceptrons. MLPs were very prominent in this competition. And they connect them into layers, and you have an input layer, uh, which in which the number of neurons depends on the number of inputs. And it connects to multiple hidden layers. And the important part of MLP is that um, it connect, every node is connected to every input in the layer before it. And then through the multiple hidden layers, it goes to the output layer. And the number of neurons in the output depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, so here, uh, the output um, would, is the price, uh, which is pretty interesting in terms of like defining like what are you actually, what do you want to actually get out of this network, and that's why you probably need more than one. Um, any questions? Cool. Uh, about convolution and neural networks. So there is a meetup, especially focused on that on Monday, and I'm not going to go into detail about. Um, CNNs in NLP because I don't know real world examples and I don't know enough about it. But since I shared my slides and Stan was um, very interested in encouraging me to say at least at least a bit about it, um, so I have um, his comment as notes because I don't want to mix it up. Um, so the reason for using convolution neural networks in NLP is because language uh, is sort of interconnected, like. CNNs in images you use because when you have an image, it's important that certain pixels are next to each other uh, because that's how you convey information in the image. And you want the neural network to understand that this, this relationship is important, that you're going through this image in a way and then having pixels next to each other is important. And it's very similar in the language because the way you construct sentences and the way you speak, um, it's important to understand those relations. So using convolutional layers um, applied to NLP makes sense because um, using a convolution uh, allows you to, to re recognize those relationships and pass it to the neural network so you can understand what, how it happens. So that's the basic idea. Why would you want to have a CNN? But if you want to know more, I'm pretty sure the meetup on Monday is going to be great and you're going to learn a lot more than I can convey here. Um, okay, and since it's NLP, there is a lot of vectorization. So I wanted to also put all the terms on one slide. So to tokenization is you take a sentence, you split it into words, or, or you take you know you take code and split it into tokens. That's the same thing uh, that happens when you parse code. Uh, stemming is removing word inflections, uh, which gives you the base um, meaning, the base root of the word, um, which is Pretty simple in English, somewhat, somewhat more complicated in other languages. And then vectorization is reducing that text you have that you tokenized and stemmed into a vector with frequencies for, for each word that was in the text. Yeah? Are there standard methods for like stemming words? Um, like, uh, or, or just because I'm sure you could have a, a novel or something and you wouldn't want to go and like stem the words manually by hand. Is there any, you know, like standard um, methods for that? Or would those also involve like some sort of a, a neural network in that? There's lots of libraries that do that. Yeah, yeah so the, Oh, okay. Okay, so in this presentation later on. Yeah, so there are standard stemmers that people use, <coughs> but in this competition, the person who had the first place solution um, did a lot of that by hand um, in their code, which was, very surprising, given that this was a third place solution, and you know there were a lot of constraints. And it, it's very hard code to read, but if you want to understand how they did that, they did a lot of manual cleanup of the data and stemming and tokenizing and removing things. So yes, people use standard stemmers, but a manual approach was good enough for a person to get to the third place, uh, which was pretty surprising for me. 
There was another question somewhere in the back. Okay, maybe we just answered that. Cool. Um, so the main methods that were used in this competition, competition were count vectorizers, vectorizer, which returns an encoded vector uh, with just integer count for each word. And this can be a pretty long vector. Uh, so one thing that was passed around in this competition a lot was sparse data, sparse neural networks. And I had a lot of problems understanding what they actually mean and, you know, why is there a problem? It's just data. But for neural networks, having a lot of sparse data means you have a ton of zeros and they don't really know what that means. So people were doing a lot of things with the text to make sure that they have enough of the sparse data so the neural network can actually learn something and not just return a bunch of zeros because there are so many zeros in the vectors that the neural network would get confused and not know what to do with that. So people did a lot of um, pre-processing with the data in order to have enough of the sparse data to teach the network something. So it was pretty important for them to, to do a lot of uh, vectorization and then a lot of mixing up things. And the other thing they used was time frequency time, times inverse document frequency vectorizer, which um, returns um, the same vector that count vectorizer does, but it weights it. Um, so it not only gives you the count for the current document, but also in the like ensemble of all the documents, so it weights the count for each word. I hope I didn't mix that up in any way. Was there any talk at the forums about uh, other things, uh, vectorizers like word to vec or something like that? Was that was just too expensive to run on the kernels? There was no word to vec anywhere. And I was so surprised because that was the first thing that came to mind for me. But people didn't use word to vec at all. And I do think part of it might be because it's just computationally uh, expensive to use that and pass it around. But there was no word to vec anywhere. Um, so if... I, I, don't, I think it might be the computational reason, but nobody addressed that because nobody used it. So it's hard for me to say what they actually thought. Does, so that, does that include, your comment include any um, embedding of, wor of words like uh, glove or fast text or cumberbatch or any, of the, any types of the word embeddings, which is making vectors from each word? So, um, none of those terms sound familiar from the competition? None of those terms sound familiar from reading oh, on the discussions at all. Um, so most of the time, and so I'm going to discuss mostly the first place solution because they had a lot of um, descriptions and a lot of comments, and the other solutions weren't in any way as much described as this one. But what it repeatedly said is, this is a very simple model. This is a very simple approach. We are really surprised this one because this doesn't make sense, right? Most of the time you see people use a lot of interesting ensembles and, and, and tools, but this was a very simple approach and it worked. And that's probably part of it is because those are kernels and people just wouldn't have enough computational you know, uh, freedom to do more complicated things. So they were, they were not coming up anywhere in, in the conversations. Yeah, I was pretty surprised too. So um, it seems like kernel, that kernels just change a little bit, yeah. I can't remember if you mentioned this at the beginning. Did uh, Mercari get into why they put these particular constraints on? Like, or was it just kernels, hooray, and let's have kernels? Um, so I, I think there was a business problem of saying like, what things were decided by Mercari and what things were decided by Kaggle because they didn't in any way address that. Um, the way it was presented is that Kaggle said, this is a great new way to do competitions. We have those kernels, you should use them. They work this way. Then they adjusted them on the way a few times. So I would probably say that the managing kernels and deciding what a kernel looks like part was Kaggle's decision, not Mercari's. Um, but I'm just inferring that from the fact that only Kaggle addressed any kernel issues or questions on, on the discussion forums. Um, as, to, as to why, they didn't really address it, but people were inferring things like, you know, this is kind of pricey to run. They probably have some constraints. They also maybe 
um, want to test some ideas. There were many suggestions, but Kaggle didn't really address those in terms of like stating their business approach. And I can understand that because they're a company. So um, yeah, so there is no clear answer to any of this. And Mercari didn't address pretty much anything in terms of like why did why does the data look this way or you know. So um, yeah, it was very vague. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. Cool. Um, cool. Uh, another thing that was used a lot was n-grams, and um, n-grams are just um, when you have a sentence, you can take one word at a time, two words at a time, five words at a time. There are also character grams, so we can take one, two n characters. And the reason people use n-grams a lot was, as I said before, they needed more data because the data was pretty sparse. So they were trying to figure out many ways of, of giving the neural networks a lot of data it could learn from. And yeah, and this is a slide just for me because when people were just throwing around epoch and batch and learning rate, I said, I don't really know what that means. Uh, so an epoch is just going through the entire data set once. A batch is when you put data into your, your model, you do it in batches. And people would say, after each epoch, I um, increased my <coughs> batch or just doubled my batch. Um, that was something they passed around a lot, so uh, it was pretty confusing for me. And um, a learning rate, um, I would say it's a model step. So when you're, like, when you're adjusting a model, um, you can choose how far you go. Um, in terms of um, tweaking it a bit. Um, but I'm a bit fuzzy on that part, so if anyone has a better explanation, that would be great. Thank you. So that's usually like with uh, gradient descent. Once you realize the direction in which to move your parameters, it's all about like moving your parameters by this much to get it, like your model is defined by your parameters. So the learning rate is just the... It's like the amount that you're going to move the parameters. Cool. Does that make sense? Yeah. When you're using uh, sparse data, um, I guess this is pretty basic, but um, is there uh, any reason um, uh, th that you might want to choose between a linear model and a sparse neural network? Um, is there any uh, rational there? So that was a question I would really love to hear an answer to because I don't really know. Like most people use sparse neural networks here, so that's what I can say, but I don't know uh, what's the advantage. Anyone? Anybody else? I can try. Um, I don't fully understand what the sparse neural network is, but if you're having a multi-layer perceptron, um, you're going to get, uh, so a linear model is going to treat each variable as like independently from every other variable. It's just going to get a constant times that variable number and then that's going to go into your final output. Whereas uh, if you have multiple layers in your, in your model, then you're going to actually get the features that are able to kind of like form relationships with each other. Yeah, and so you've got, it's a much more powerful model but it's, uh, there's going to be a lot more parameters and a lot more room, room to overfit with that model. So that kind of explains why a lot of people were using regularizers, I guess, to prevent the model from getting too out of control. Okay. When you have a dictionary, let's say 200,000 words, obviously in any particular description, you will only have like maybe 100 words that are different. So most of your entries in that vector will be zeros. Mm -hmm. So those will be your inputs to the neural network, roughly speaking. So, so there will be a lot of zeros there yeah. in the inputs. Yeah, it's all backwards. Yeah, so... I guess I'm a bit lost Light. on. <laughs> well, I don't know if I need a mic to say that I'm just lost. <laughs> <laughs> so what I can say is that they were trying to start with like linear approaches, but they started using sparse neural networks, and that improved um, the outcomes. So the data they used and the approaches they used have improved a lot. Um, but I don't 
also know like how do you because they said a lot of a about sparse neural networks, and it seemed like it's not only about the input of the data, there is some tweak there, but nobody really explained it. Okay, I yeah. think I have sort of figured it out in my head, and this is going to kind of be a guess, but I, I, I'm assuming that it's just a way, the, the neural network on its own is still the same, it would still produce the same output, but when you're dealing with a sparse input, you're probably able to just ignore a lot of the tree completely, put a sparse input into the neural network, and then only had the neural network tune the kind of inputs that actually matter as opposed to having as opposed to just putting all these zeros into the neural network uh, at the beginning it's Does that make sense okay cool Br uh, Bruce uh, uh, maybe No, I don't think it's the same as an embedding. Because okay, an we can talk about it over beer. We have yes. 10 minutes. Beer. So I'll try to go through the submissions. That will be fun. Okay, leaderboard. So um, this competition was pretty close, uh, apart from the first place solution, which was like much better than other solutions. Uh, so it was 0.37, whereas the third place was 0.39. But then you can see that the gold and silver are pretty close. So... Uh, it was interesting that they were able to do it this well. And before they merged, they had pretty good models on their own. Uh, so Pavo uh, had multiple rich models, and he used the category uh, in terms of, like, you know, women's clothing and bags, so forth. And he started with, with, with training those rich models, and then they, he used those rich models and tra trained a sparse input neural network and he targeted the difference between predictions and actual prices, which is um, the loss function for this competition, and then used that to train a residual model light GBM. And Konstantin um, used a sparse uh, MLP uh, with TensorFlow and then uh, used a convoluted neural network. And he said, you know, it didn't really make much sense. Uh, it wasn't really great, but it was so different from MLP that it gave me a lot of boost in my results when I connected um, outcomes from both of those. So when they merged, they decided uh, one model trained on multiple different sets of data is better than the other way around. So they stick to one model. And the advantage of that was it has a, had a lot of capacity, so they, had, they could do a lot of feature interactions. And because they did MLP, they said, you know, in this setup, it was just much faster. And that's what they reiterated a lot in their discussion was that this allowed us to have an edge over everyone else because we were able to do it much faster on this setup. Uh, so a lot, a lot about this competition was also about choosing the right setup uh, for the task. And they had 12 resulting solutions and then merge them using a LASSO model. So that was when I mentioned that some of their models didn't really add up to the final solution, so they had to scratch those, and that they said it was pretty funny for them to throw away good models. Um, so they did name chargrams, uh, which allowed them to have more dense features than the sparse feature product. Yeah? No worries. Sorry, uh, silly question. Um, what is a chargram? So a chargram is an n-gram, but on uh, characters instead of words. So you take like one letter at a time or two letters at a time. Cool. Uh, so the chargrams allowed them on the name feature, uh, on the name variable, allowed them to produce denser data. And then they did a standard porter stemmer, and that was the only time anybody mentioned what kind of stemmer they actually used. So it didn't seem like it mattered a lot in this competition. And then they did, did vectorization, and they had issues with like um, bundled data, um, so they decided to just just remove it from the data set. <laughs> uh, then they did concatenation of the text fields, but they decided not to do all of them at once. Uh, they just concatenated them in like subgroups. Uh, so they said it just reduced the dim dimensionality. So it helped them in the end to, to make the model work better. And they were also trying to like think of possible ways of getting meaningful features out of the text itself, like using four women or four guys or whatever. But it didn't work, so they just scratched that. 
Um, so they managed to train those 12 models uh, on about 200,000 features. And they said they doubled the batch size after each epoch. Uh, so they trained faster. And then they lowered the layering rate um, on every batch size increase. Um, yeah, so they said everything was because um, there were two stages in this, um, in this competition. Uh, they were trying to tune it as intentionally as possible to also let it pass the second stage that they didn't have any control over. So uh, they're trying to get the best validation score after the second epoch and then overfit after the third epoch, which was an interesting assumption to have. Um, yeah, I don't really have a lot of time to talk about it, but what they did is um, they had different preprocessing schemes and then they had three data sets with four models each. So that gave them 12 because um, they multiply that by the number of models. And they had different tokenization um, in the models uh, and with and without stemming. So there was two models and then two types of differentiation. And then they had <coughs> counted vectorization on TFIDF vectorizer. So that gave them the four models, which were actually one model, but they just had different um, approaches to, uh, to data. And they made the first hidden layer bigger. And they said it helped them a lot in tuning the model. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to brush. You've got like 13 minutes. So we can just, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think you said 10 minutes earlier, but you've got, you've got more time. No worries. Um, sorry. Uh, anyway, is that, was that clear even though it was brushed? Uh, how um, increasing the batch size and reducing the learning rate, are they not um, um, equivalent actions like when you're trying like uh, simulated annealing stuff, that's what they're trying to mimic over there. Is it not having a similar effect, like increasing the batch size uh, in every epoch and um, reducing the training, training rate? Uh, it, don't they seem similar in some context? So somebody actually said that in a competition, that they did one instead of doing the other because they said it's like doing the same thing. Uh, so it seems like they had the same idea, but they did both. I'm not sure what's the advantage. OK, I can just have a swing at it. Um, when you do larger batch sizes, you're pulling out features that are more general to the data set because you typically do a batch and then you average all of your parameter updates. And so if you do really small batches, you're going to be moving your parameters around a lot in kind of the direction of your small batch. Whereas if you do like if you if you do a batch as the whole data set at once, you're just going to be pulling out the parameter changes that kind of like uh, are general across the whole data set. Yeah, so I think that there are, is a difference. This is the first time I've ever seen anybody adjusting the batch size in the middle of training. I think it's a very interesting idea. And it makes sense because at the beginning you want to be um, probably tuning the parameters really finely or really specifically to each, uh, to each data set. And then uh, as you go along, you want more general updates. Yeah, but the two um, other solutions are not strong. I, I think that uh, lowering the learning rate and increasing the batch size would both tend to lead you more steadily in the <coughs> down direction in general, but uh, not if you have batch norm, right? Which, to train faster, you'd probably have batch norm somewhere in there. You'll get more you noise. Batch norm? No. No? no. Okay. There was no mention of that. Well, they're, they're using regularizers within the models, or within, the, within these models they're using a regularizer? Uh, no, they're just using a regularizer. This final approach, they're just using the regularizer at the very end to like take all the MLPs and connect them into one big model. So they're not really doing that here. Uh, but they started off with using uh, ridge models to, to get the approach they ended up with. Um, 
I think they, there is a lot of the, that they didn't say that they learned about the data and, and the approach along the way. So can I be clear, that you, are you saying the top three models all used um, bag of words or TFIDF style inputs? So this is not, the that's the top, the, that's only the first version, right? the first one? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But we, we didn't talk about two before this? Uh, we talked about the first... What they did before they decided on the first approach. So oh, we nice. talked about the the two approaches they had before they merged, and how they came to a okay, to a shared solution. Yeah, sorry, that wasn't clear. No. Cool. Um, okay, so they shared a kernel that's very readable and very fun to, to read. It's like eighty five lines of code. Uh, if you have some time, it's very interesting. Um, so. They said they did some. They did basically that, but also added some tweaks. Uh, so they had two additional model variations uh, using a different loss function and doing classification on one of those instead of. Um, um, sorry, <laughs> I lost the word. Um, so anyway, the classification one. Um, they instead of treating the price as a. Um, one variable, they split it into 64 buckets uh, to classify um, the products into different buckets of prices. And they calculated an L2 distance from the centers of the buckets uh, for the prediction, and then they applied a softmax. So they tried a different approach to try to classify the prices instead of predicting the prices, um, which was pretty interesting. And for two out of four models for each data set, um, they binarized, binarized the input data during training um, by setting all known zero values to one, and that added also some diversity to their approach. Um, and they did an alt to regular, regularization for the first layer, so I guess they used um, it here. So you're right that they used it in the first layer for so the mod. L2 regularization is rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's rich regression in the first layer, uh, and they said that gave them a boost too. Yeah. So that's what you would use. Um, and they also discussed a lot of like differences between TensorFlow and MXNet because they wrote solutions in both. And I don't want to get into that because I don't really have a good sense of how they are different. But they said the MXNet in the end was better, and that was their um, their intuition that it's going to be much faster and better. Okay, I'm just wondering if anybody in the room is familiar with. Because it's the first time I've heard about MXNet. Uh, yeah, it's, it's coming up now. I mean, it looks like it's, it's, it might actually be better than TensorFlow from what I've seen. I haven't yeah. worked with it. So. Especially if you use Google, it is quite optimized. So it's, it's pre compiled to graph. So it, it, it's a lazy evaluation. So it actually tries to optimize at the end of your execution to find the best way to optimize it. So the algorithms are quite the same, but it's, it's pretty good optimized in the computation. It's quite, it's, it's might be good though. Towards the chairs. Uh, with MXNet, that's what I'm not sure. It's probably not. It tried to push it as. I think the. What language is it written in? Or is it just. It has wrappers in most languages. It definitely comes with Python and R. I think it's with C. Uh, they're doing it with Matlab and Python. The guy that's doing the talk on Monday uh, works with MXNet, I believe. Yeah, he's the evangelist for MXNet. Official or not official? Uh, official. Really? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. I'm just like, the only thing I'm worried about is that people in the back didn't hear the interesting discussion. Oh, um, so next time you have one, just have a mic in the middle. Yeah, the uh, mic. You can have one that works. Yeah, there's one that works. So what they said is basically, um, and I'm going to summarize it terribly, but they said that uh, MXNet looks like the new kid on the block, and it's um, faster because it has an optimization at the end. Go. Am I saying right things? Yes, and you can do it in R, Python, and C, and it's a fun thing to check out. I'm not going to repeat everything you just said. Uh, so anyway, they said MXNet is better too. Uh, it was for them, but they wrote solutions in both TensorFlow and MXNet. 
it was a very fun um, first place discussion. So the second place, they had four models. Uh, they had a rich model, uh, trade on unigrams and custom bigrams, and the way they approached the custom bigrams, they concatenated the names, the name with the first five words from description, and got the unique words, and then created all possible two-way combinations of those, like both ways concatenation. <laughs> they had one sparse neural network with count vectorizer using name and description. They basically just used name and description throughout their training. Uh, they had a fast text neural network, uh, and they also had another sparse neural networks with just chargrams uh, for name and description instead of having uh, the count vectorizer here. And they connected all four of those, and it allowed them to get down to 388. And the pre-processing they did was pretty interesting because they just kept a maximum of 60 words for all names and descriptions, and they just did it to all the free text. So it seems like the, the length of the description, like they just ignore it after some point and it works for them. And they labeled, uh, label encoded the brands and categories and then concatenated them with name. Um, that's basically all they said about the solution. They have code which is somewhat readable, uh, readable and it might be interesting. I didn't really get into that because it was pretty intense to read it. Um, but that's everything they wrote about the solution. And yeah, and they said they spent like a lot of time trying to build a light GBM, but it, it didn't help, uh, even though it was the best model in their ensemble. Um, so they didn't really address that. That was interesting. Why didn't you use the best model? But it fi they figured they didn't need it. Uh, and yeah, they also doubled the batch size after each epoch. And the third place solution had two models. Um, they had a convolution neural network and they had um, a factorization machines with follow the regularized leader, um, have read that right model. Um, their code is very readable in terms of like understanding the logic of it, but it's really interesting because as I said before, they did manual cleaning of the data and like trying to figure out the features on their own. And they, did, they didn't seem to use a stammer or anything like that. Um, and that's, that's basically what they said about the solution. So if you have a lot of time, the code is pretty lengthy, uh, but there is a lot of maybe potentially interesting stuff there, especially since this was third place. Um, so hopefully it, it was fun. And like, this was the highest um, ranking no neural nets for solution, as far as I can tell, at least from the ones um, I could read and understand what's happening. Um, so um, they also use boosting and they used naive base uh, to correct the rich models. Um, it wasn't very clear, like the, the reason they said they didn't use a neural network was because they, were, they knew they were unable to train a neural network that would, was going to be below 0.42, so they decided to not use neural nets and do the best they can without neural nets. And they, they've had a lot of like discussions and, and it seems like they had a lot of understanding about the, um, the data and, and a lot of good ideas, but in the end, it didn't really help them to get uh, a very good solution because the neural nets were clearly better here, even though it seemed like they had a chance. Um, yeah? They said they are no good at neural nets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They said they they are unable to create a neural net that's going to go below 0.42, and that's why they use other things because they don't know how to work with neural networks. Um, and they got a lot of praise for that too um, in the discussions. So people said this is the best solution, obviously, because you know the most about the data. Um, I don't really have a strong opinion on that, but there, there was like a lot of people saying this should this solution should get some so, sort of recognition because they actually did more in terms of understanding how this works. Yeah, not just throwing neural networks at it. Yep. That's all. Is this one running? It works. Oh, it works now. Now it works. <laughs> Uh, okay, 
<laughs> so uh, this, this is just a question to um, you know NLP experts uh, out here. Um, how do you really do uh, feature selection in this kind of setting where you know you have lots of dimensions, you have so many combinations? Um, do you you know really wait for the regularizer thing to take care of feature selection, um, or you know is there? Uh, I mean, or, or do, do you use some kind of visualization to? Um, uh, so yeah, this is, this this is just a question to NLP folks here. Well, I I can say I I made a model that's in use and it I just let the model sort it out. I don't try to select any that's features. I just throw all the text in, and um, and so I'm using sparse. So I turn my text into sparse vectors. It's very simple. It's like you said in the beginning, some. Models Simple. <laughs> and I just let the model sort it out. So the the different types of models you can throw throw on top of that include like the simplest like logistic regression or linear models. And I've also had success with um, with like using Keras, TensorFlow, uh, but very shallow networks on top of that. And then you just let the model figure out what's what features are important. Um, so um, uh, the the second place solution, for example, um, you know they they had tried uh, all two way combinations of words uh, for it, um, and, and there's some you know arbitrariness in that uh, you know kind of decision. Um, so uh, let's say you know there are some five word combinations that might actually do better. So um, uh, how I mean you're 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 using a logistic regression, for example, and that doesn't really generate this combination. So they are manual decisions, and there's no model actually guiding you to, you know, out of that. So I, I can't speak to that directly, but I can say you can iterate through different sizes of, of grams or whatever, and just try something that's not too big that it overwhelms your computational resources, uh, but might give you still some gain. Okay, so this conversation we're going to have after, but if there's questions for the presenter, we can take a couple more and then we're going to run out of time. So it's it's more on the uh, the type of uh, solutions where you use like a ridge regression, like no no uh, no neural nets. How do you uh, use those features um, like that retain text basically? So you would have like characters or words. Uh, so in the case of logistic regression, what are you actually? What are what are the type of features that you use in that in the model? Are they words or a combination of words? Yeah. And so, so either words or or um, combinations of words like n-grams of so words. Be like interaction variables between like multiple variables. Uh, that's not really what n-gram is. In, in, interaction would be like any old two words anywhere in the text, but n-gram is like two words that show next to each other. So it's slightly, it's like much simpler than intera interactions. And then there would be like many, many features. Yeah. Okay, questions about the speed or at least. I don't know if comments if that counts. We want comments. I hate comments. <laughs> it's on. Um, no, it isn't. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure what exactly logarithm they're using in their metrics. If it's Depending which one it is, the average for the best price, if my if my math is good, is fifteen percent error, and uh, if it's logarithm of ten, that's forty percent of error, the average, which kind of shows that these even even though these results are the best, forty percent of an error of a price is not really a a good prediction. The, I I think this is one of those data where you squeeze the most out of it. But because the data is quite noisy, it is just not too much to squeeze out of it in the end. That we're still just tuning the models to the best, the best solution. But the best solution is not actually predicting anything. It's just another. It's predicting the data itself, but it's not actually a good model to predict uh, general relation. Okay, this is another conversation for the, the pub. That, that's a great uh, point. That's a great point. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask what you found most interesting in doing this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a laugh. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so as an economist, what makes me sad is that this competition wasn't about, about economics at all. And it was all about NLP. And I was, I was sad because you would think, you know, decision trees and, and the economic theory should make sense here because this is a marketplace. Um, so for me, it was a bit of um, understanding that this machine learning thing is going to disrupt much more than I'm, I was prepared to agree on. Um, because I used to do like predictions of this sort in healthcare. Uh, with real data, and it seems like we're going in the right direction, but maybe not. Uh, but the most interesting part in terms of like learning what people are using, um, I, I think like tweaking both your model and tweaking your environment and understanding your environment and working in more real world um, you know, environments in general is something I'm looking forward to in Kaggle, which, because other competitions to me seem like just a lot of ensembles, a lot of things that people are throwing at it to get the best results, but not necessarily usable results. So this was interesting in terms of having usable results that actually someone can then work on top of. And then about the data, those were, like the training data and test data was listings, right, with the prices? But did they never tell you if those listings ever sold? Like, if are people, are all those listings bad, badly priced or, so, or, no, those are actually listings that were sold. Oh, um, they were all yeah, sold. Yeah, so okay. those are only the listings ah, that were sold you. some some time, but they didn't say when and, you know, it, they didn't say if it was the original price that they sold for. So th they only gave it sold listings, yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's it. Uh, let's give Alicia another big round of applause. <laughs>